So I'm going to keep my remarks very brief. Um, I am the, the lawyer on the panel. Um, and my area of focus, as Jess said, is public bioethics, which is the governance of science, medicine, and biotechnology in the name of ethical goods. It's the point at which law and public policy come into contact with the ethical questions that arise from advances in biomedical science and biotechnology. So I'm gonna share my screen with you very briefly. And, uh, and I'm just gonna make a very short point. And these are points that I make in the book that uh, Jess alluded to. One is a methodological point, which I'll spend a little bit of time on. And uh, the other is a substantive point, which we'll defer to the question period if you, if you like to, if you wanna take that up. The methodological claim of my very brief remarks this evening and the claims of the book is that the richest and most potent method of analyzing matters of public bioethics, or really any area of the law and public policy, but especially public bioethics, is through what I describe as an inductive anthropological inquiry, which sounds hyper-technical and highfalutin, but in fact is not. It's, it's very straightforward. All it means is that you take the law or policy as you find it. That's in, in that sense, it's inductive. And it's an anthropological inquiry asking the question of what is the vision of human identity and flourishing that anchors and animates law and public policy in the particular space under consideration. In the book, I take up the issues of abortion, the law of abortion, the law relating to assisted reproduction, and the law touching and concerning end-of-life decision-making. And when I analyze those vital conflicts of American public bioethics through this anthropological inquiry, what came to the surface was a vision of the human person and human flourishing that I argue in the book is very impoverished. It's a vision that closely tracks what philosopher Charles Taylor and <clears throat> social scientist Robert Bella have described as expressive individualism. It reduces people to radical individual wills that are uh, whose highest flourishing is to seek um, to, to live out the own authentic truths they discover inside themselves, regardless and abstracted from any constitutive relationship to family, community, tradition, nation, uh, etc. And it's a vision of human identity and flourishing that I argue cannot make sense of the most vexing problems that we have in American public bioethics. Indeed, it can't even make sense of the, um, <clears throat> of, it can't even see vulnerable populations who we should pay, uh, pay special care for, namely the elderly, children, uh, and the disabled. And the principal reason why this vision of human personhood and flourishing fails is because it takes, it fails to take seriously our embodiment, the fact that we live as, not in, but as bodies, we experience the world around us as bodies, we experience ourselves as bodies, one another in the same way uh, as fragile, corruptible bodies in time. And um, and, and this is the right question to ask, I argue, this anthropological question of law and public policy, first of all, because law is irreducibly normative, it, it always reflects uh, what goods a given polity cares about, what harms they're seeking to avoid. Every law, every law is explainable through the lens of the goods that it aims at or the harms that it seeks to avoid. And therefore it tells us a lot sort of reflectively about the community itself and what it cares about. But then also for better or worse, it tends to help people uh, understand what they should believe about right and wrong and justice and freedom and autonomy and equality and, and, and related goods. But below that level of the basic goods that law aims to promote, law has to assume a set of propositions about what and who people are and what uh, in, in, in what constitutes their flourishing and thriving. And that's for the very simple reason that law is about and for the protection and flourishing of persons. Law only makes sense, it's only intelligible, it's only, it's certainly only just and wise and humane if it is in the business of protecting persons or promoting the flourishing of persons. And that being the case, law necessarily and must unavoidably rest upon usually undeclared conceptions of human identity. Um, and I argue that the, the, the richest way to understand the law is to drill down and to ask the question of which vision of human identity and flourishing is, is animating and anchoring the law. Who and what does the law assume persons to be? And for the law to be wise and just and humane generally, but especially in the, in the, in the field of bioethics, public bioethics, it has to take seriously our lives as, as embodied beings. And the inexorable entailments of our embodiment are, are but as living beings who get sick, who die, who grow old, is that we are vulnerable. Uh, we are therefore mutually de dependent upon one another. It actually situates us into, into relationships with one another where we have can make claims on each other and, and come to one another's aid. <clears throat> and we're all subject to natural limits. And what 
uh, the law should do and what we should do in our private capacities to promote the flourishing of ourselves and other embodied beings is to construct what Alistair McIntyre has called networks of unconditional and uncalculated giving and graceful receiving, networks of people who are willing to make the good of others their own good without seeking anything in return. That's what it means to be human in the richest sense. And these networks are essential first for our basic survival because everyone comes into the world and leaves the world um, uh, in the very best case scenario in a state of complete dependence upon other people. But it's also essential for our flourishing, which is to learn how to become the thing that we, I argue, are meant to become, namely the kind of people who can make the good of others our own good without seeking anything in return. And to put, put it most directly and concisely, I argue in the book and, and will argue now that human beings by virtue of their embodiment are made for love and friendship and the measuring stick for the law and its justice and its wisdom and its humanity is how much or how little it contributes to the building up and sustaining of these networks. So uh, I'll stop there. On a event that, for an event that's titled Morality in the Microscope, you probably don't want to hear too much from the theologian. It's time to get to the uh, scientist and medic, right? But um, I am going to I am going to share my screen here and talk about the, theologians and theology. So, shocker, theologians uh, who do bioethics don't agree with each other about lots and lots and lots of things. Um, you know, we prioritize similar things sometimes, but it can rain run the gamut. I just put a list of things. On the slide, like nonviolence, social justice, priority of concern for the vulnerable and voiceless, honoring rules, especially exceptionalist moral norms, uh, pursuing in virtue, avoiding vice. And unfortunately, uh, I have to say, many of the debates uh, in our discipline mirror the debates of secular bioethics pretty closely. Um, something you wouldn't expect, actually, I think, if we are working from a common tradition, but nevertheless, um, that's just true. Uh, but there is one thing we can agree on, I think, and that's that theologians basically invented the field of bioethics. Um, it's a subdiscipline of moral theology, uh, as a subdiscipline of moral theology. And if you think for just a couple seconds about the history of the church when it comes to medicine, and uh, especially in the Western world, um, the development of hospitals and systems, um, and how... Um, uh, uh, nuns and many other uh, religious orders have been involved uh, in healthcare. It's not too difficult to imagine how or why um, this came to be the case. I like to use this example as something that um, really has um, driven a lot of uh, what what the church has come to 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 call medical ethics, and it's the the example of a battlefield medic actually, who. Uh, was called multiple times, obviously, battlefield medics actually called to the field multiple times and decide whether or not uh, to do an amputation of a limb of a, of a medieval soldier. And there was, there was a lot of confusion at the time because, uh, as you might imagine, before the advent of, of pain medication, um, the, a lot of soldiers didn't want legs amputated, even if they knew it was required to save their life. And so when battlefield medics uh, went to their confessors, they weren't sure how to think about this morally. Should they confess? Like, if they didn't cut off the soldier's leg um, to some kind of, you know, participation in their suicide or aiming at their death or something like that. Um, but eventually the church rightly came to the position that no, um, they were not aiming at their deaths and physicians participating in this were not participating in aiming at their deaths. They used double effect, uh, the, pr the principle of double effect to make a distinction between what they were aiming at and what they foresaw but, um, uh, but did not intend. And thus the distinction between ordinary means of treatment, which are required and extraordinary means of treatment was born. And that's a distinction that's really kept, um, was really absorbed by secular medicine and is still being used today, though often by different means like proportionate or disproportionate uh, means of treatment. That's just one example. There's many, many other examples of this, especially if you go to this book, which I highly recommend, uh, The Story of Bioethics. Um, and Charles Curran, the theologian Charles Curran has a wonderful chapter in that book uh, about some of the history. So if you're if you're somewhat skeptical that theologians invented the discipline, um, I, I, I commend that chapter uh, to you. Um, but there was the beginning of the end for this really strong relationship between theology and bioethics uh, starting in the 1970s. Um, there was a distinct shift away from theology to philosophy. And, and even theologians who were still uh, pretty active and respected around that time, 
uh, were forced essentially to translate their theology out of their discussions. Um, Daniel Callahan in his book, which I recommend really, uh, really strongly, um, In Search of the Good, A Life in Bioethics, details a lot of this shift. Um, and Callahan said he tried to fight for theology, but philosophers moved quickly to overshadow and eventually simply push aside the moral theologians. They did so by means of different language and concepts, sharply contrasting styles of argumentation, and with some exceptions, a strikingly secular outlook and open hostility to religious ideas. So that's a very important part of the story uh, here, too, that I want to tell. And um, I just thought I'd mention, I just show some photos of Dan Callahan. This is Dan, when he started the Hastings Center, one of the most, probably the most um, well, the, the probably the first secular bioethics center we could talk about, um, and he and his wife founded it. This is Sidney Callahan and his wife, a photo of them later in life. They were just a fantastic um, bioethics team. I could tell you more stories, but I'm looking at my time here at already five minutes, so I'm not going to say more about this. Okay, um, in my book um, that was mentioned um, at the start, Losing Our Dignity, um, my my central thesis is that the basis for fundamental human equality, which is a shared nature bearing the divine image, has been ruled out of the contemporary bioethics conversation because of this dramatic shift. Professor Sneed has been the best at showing um, the shift that he, and he just explained a little bit about expressive individualism kind of taking uh, place of a, of a uh, genuinely Christian anthropology. Um, but the way I talk about it in the book is that the theological concept um, that ruled for so long has been replaced things by like actualized will, rationality, self-awareness, autonomy, and productivity. Uh, and as a result of this shift, it's just a million percent clear that not all human beings have these traits in the same capacity, uh, and many uh, appear not to have them at all. Uh, and as a result, uh, the a uh, set of human beings who are protected by fundamental equality under the law uh, has, has shrunk pretty dramatically since uh, this shift, um, this secularized shift uh, has taken place. And here is a slide that, uh, that has four different images, and I want to talk briefly about all four of them as different examples of um, how folks have fallen out of this circle of protection. And my book goes into much more detail about this, but I'll just, I'll just touch on them uh, for a bit, each of them for a bit, and then, um, and then I'll be quiet and we'll listen to Dr. Collier and we'll get your questions. Uh, the top left um, image is the grave of Terry Schiavo and uh, the headstone from the grave of Terry Schiavo. I think it's so interesting to think about what her husband, who in the, many of you probably know the story of Terry Schiavo, I probably don't have time to get into a great detail about it, but she was, um, uh, had this catastrophic brain injury in 1990 and was deemed to be in a so-called vegetative state, a pretty offensive term actually to use about living members of the human family, in my view. Um, but then uh, her husband was involved in this fight with her um, parents and, and siblings um, and he ended up winning the battle and she was um, uh, dehydrated and starved to death on uh, March uh, 31st, 2005. The way that uh, he describes it, of course, the husband describes it, who, who, who won the battle and got, um, got to uh, uh, make this headstone, says he, that she departed this earth when she had her catastrophic brain injury, but was at peace uh, in, in, on March uh, 31st, 2005, when she died after being um, dehydrated and starved to death. Um, what, what I hope is clear here is, um, uh, if anything, you, if any of you know about what Terry Schiavo's life was like after she had her catastrophic brain injury, I mean, she was very clearly a living member of the species Homo sapiens, responded to music, light, even sound, depending, or, or people's voices, depending um, on how you think about her, her reactions. And so it's very interesting that the kind of uh, um, the dualism here, right, this, this kind of Gnostic dualism that makes a distinction between the body, another thing that Carter really mentioned in his book in his previous remarks, that were embodied creatures, um, basically went out the window. The living body was not her. She had departed this earth at that point. I think, I think this is a very, very key uh, point in our, in our discussions of these matters. I'll go more briefly going through these, these other examples because I think that's really, really a central point. Um, at the upper uh, right here, we have a headline from the Washington Post about 
uh, Canada um, legalizing uh, physician assisted suicide for disabled uh, people. I think it's better to call it physician assisted killing actually, um, which fits into my thesis quite neatly, unfortunately about, um, you know, uh, us moving from fundamental human equality to things like, well, if you're rational, self-aware, um, productive, autonomous, that, that's why you matter. And if you don't, then, then maybe we can understand why you'd wanna kill yourself. The bottom right uh, uh, example is, is of uh, one World Trade Center being lit by governor, former New York governor, Andrew Cuomo. After the Reproductive Health Act was passed in New York, this was his celebration of essentially New York State legalizing abortion up to birth. I, can't, I don't think you can think of a better example um, of what I'm talking about than that. And uh, then finally, in the lower right here, this New York Times headline from an investigation that they found that um, very, very high percentages of uh, residents in nursing homes that have uh, later stage dementia um, were, are being given um, essentially um, uh, antipsychotic drugs to keep them docile. Um, we're not totally sure why, but if you, if you kind of speculate, it's likely because uh, lack of resources, lack of ability to care uh, for these patients, but um, it triples the chance, these kind of drugs triple the chances of their death and essentially serve as a chemical straitjacket in ways that they can't really act as the human beings that they are. And my book is really at pains to argue that uh, this is the next uh, um, population to fall if we continue on our current trajectory, if we don't embrace the theological basis for fundamental like human, uh, human equality that all human beings share in nature which uh, reflects the image and likeness of God. So I'll stop there. So you've heard two perspectives tonight on bioethics, the judicial perspective and the theological perspective. And I'm here to give you the medical perspective, but it's like we're holding a big diamond, right? And admiring its different facets, but it's all just one big, beautiful diamond, of course. So yes, I'm the medical doctor of the group, but in this vein, I will not be able to keep the theological or philosophical perspectives out of my discussion because these distinctions are all artifactual anyway. Limitations of language paradigms set in each professional discipline, but in practice, our beliefs and actions must be holy and true, not just agreed upon. Ethics is a broad term and can be really confusing for folks. Many people with whom I speak, when you ask them about what they think of when they think of clinical medical ethics, they think of it really as coming down to questions such as, should we or should we not pull the plug? And yes, end of life decision making is part of medical ethics for sure, but it is not the entirety of clinical medical ethics. As Rita Sharon, the mother of narrative medicine, once told me at a workshop, she said, Kristen, every encounter is an ethical encounter. When I first heard that a few years ago, I thought, you know, what did she mean by that? How could that be? Is ethics really that pervasive and all encompassing? Is an ethics just for dealing with the tough marginal cases? But I now too have come to see every encounter as an ethical encounter. It's because every patient encounter encounters a patient, a human being. Every encounter with a human being is ethics because we are trying to discern the good in every encounter. Ethics is a way of being and encountering one another toward the good. So I'd like to use a story here regarding one of my patients while I'll call Mrs. Wheaton. It was early in the pandemic and Mrs. Wheaton's daughter called me and said she needed to talk to me about some symptoms her mom was having, but they couldn't bring her in to see me because she couldn't walk for the past couple of weeks. So we set up a video visit and there was Mrs. Wheaton in her recliner surrounded by her very large family. And I could tell right away that something wasn't right after talking to her. And after I talked to her and her family, I actually thought that she had symptoms of cord compression, which is where the spinal cord is being pressed upon often by a tumor and that she needed to go to the hospital right away. She looked at me through the camera and said, I'm not going. And when I asked her why, she said, I'm not going into that hospital alone. You see our visitor policies had just changed with the pandemic, allowing no one to accompany our adult patients except in very rare circumstances. Mrs. Wheaton was almost 90 years old. She had difficulty hearing and was incredibly close to her large family. She would have struggled communicating with the healthcare teams I know. And she might've been allowed one family member at her bedside if the team thought she was actively dying, but that was it. So the hospital had made the policy to reduce the risk of infection to their staff, which is important. But how did these policies weigh up against other goods, such as having family members at the bedside, for example, which we know helps patients do better? And who did these policies disproportionately affect? 
So in this space of ethics as Christians, we really should be helping each other think about and through the should questions, the why questions, because these conversations matter as the series of this um, title of the series harkens to. So when I think of ethics, I think of three fundamental terms. I think of good, right, and ought or duty. Peter Kreeft speaks of this like a house. The three terms are like doors in a house. The house is ethics, and you can enter the whole house through any one of these three doors as all the terms are relative to each other. So how do we discern the good? And how does this impact the practice of medicine? This reminds me of a quote from the book of Titus where Paul writes, Jesus Christ gave himself to purify for himself a people eager to do what is good, Titus 2.14. How are we supposed to know what the good is? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint, but if you look at Titus 2.15, there is no list. There are no clarifying statements. So how are we supposed to know what to do? The vision of the good does not depend on the time, age, or country in which one is reading this. We are shown the vision of the good according to the Lord in scripture, and we have the Holy Spirit to guide us in our decision makings. The specific tasks at hand, of course, will be different depending on the age, but the underlying view of the good and the guiding hand of the Holy Spirit will be the same as it has been and will be until the Lord himself returns. So thinking about this good, what are our first principles or vision of the good that we should have as Christians, and how do we know what they are? Some people here turn to Hippocrates. So this is a painting of Hippocrates. He's actually pushing away um, with his foot um, some coins that were a bribe that was offered to him that he rejects. So Hippocrates had a sense that the vocation of, of medicine mattered immensely. At the beginning of the Hippocratic Oath, many of you know, there is an appeal to the divine. And we are reminded there that we are not the sole arbitrators of health, wellness, and disease and healing. In the oath, it says, I will not give a lethal drug to anyone. I will not give a woman a pessary to cause an abortion. I will enter homes for the benefit of the sick. So in the Hippocratic Oath, the key issue here is that the benefit of the sick that is mentioned has been interpreted in many various ways, just like the good that's mentioned in Titus 2. And if we aren't clear as Christians what those terms mean and let others define them for us, we aren't going to be able to be faithful. And without it, you run the error of thinking physician-assisted suicide is a good or that euthanasia is in the benefit of the sick. So yes, we have the Hippocratic Oath, but we have so much more revelation than did Hippocrates. We have the revelation of God through his word, something Hippocrates did not have. So we should be able to go deeper and our commitments to our work should be richer, brighter, and more glorious. What a difference it should make in our practice of medicine when we conform our vision to Christ in order to discern the good. One beautiful thing about having your ethics based on Christian theological principles, in my opinion, is the richness. Science and biology by themselves don't have a proper cosmology or beginning or a telos, an end. They just are. And without a beginning, knowing where we come from and an end to whom we belong and where we will go when we die, there can be no meaning. And without meaning, you end up defaulting to what you see today as the reigning type of bioethics, a utilitarian ethics, and one that's based solely on autonomy as the overriding principle. As long as I can give consent and it doesn't hurt others, Anything's permissible. If I can give consent, for example, to kill myself or to have myself killed, what lesser things can I consent to and demand? For example, there are patients who want healthy limbs amputated for a variety of reasons. Is this ethical? Is this good? Is this healthcare? When we have no beginning and no end and therefore really no meaning, our bodies are just things as Carter talks about in his book or tools through which we operationalize our will. Our bodies are just bio stuff without any inherent meaning. We aren't living souls in this framework, but just molecules in motion. But if we do have a purpose, then only those choices that lead us towards fulfilling our purpose can be called good or ethical. If we have no purpose, then we can do anything that we want. What we have instead as Christians and what can help guide our ethics is profoundly different. Our patients manifest the image of God and because of that, our work has inherent meaning. You aren't taking care of a diabetic or a clump of cells. You are taking care of the Imago Dei, someone made by God in his image with inviolable dignity and inherent worth. When you're talking with your parishioners or your students, ask them, do they see a 48-year-old successful businessman who's in the hospital with a heart attack 
the same way in which they see an 89 year old woman who's in the hospital with end stage dementia and pneumonia. And if not, why not? Because the way we see patients has real consequences. To illustrate that, I'd like to tell the story of Michael Hickson. Michael Hickson was hospitalized during the pandemic with COVID-19. A few years prior to this, he had suffered an out of hospital cardiac arrest and had resultant brain injury that had left him with cognitive and physical limitations. He was married and had children and was very close to his family. When he was hospitalized, the treating physician refused to give him remdesivir for his COVID related lung disease. His wife videotaped the discussion and she asked the doctor why her husband isn't being offered the medication. And the doctor says it's because he doesn't have a quality of life and the wife asks why not and the doctor's recorded saying it's because he is not a walking and talking person. This reminds me of the Texas Advanced Directives Act, where physicians are allowed to unilaterally, against family wishes, withdraw care, or not offer care to people who they feel have a medically futile situation. This is becoming a standard accepted practice at many hospitals across the country. This is a lot of power to give a group of people who we know, like all of us, have certain biases. I have to say, before I was a Christian, I didn't see everyone as having equal value. I used ableist terms like quality of life and dehumanizing terms like vegetable and productive member of society. It's easy to like patients who we like and who are often are like us. And I know from personal experience, doctors can be very ableist as well as ageist. Because who do we see as mattering? Who is included in the circle of the we? Who do we value and who do we not? Because this view of the human being and what gives them value, if not rooted in the Imago Dei, like Charlie alluded to, is going to be rooted in what people can do. And this leaves out swaths of human beings who have disabilities, dementia, close head injury, et cetera. And I tell these stories to illustrate something that you likely already know, but it's worth repeating. There are different ways that patients view human life. And the same is true for physicians. Getting this right that is having a view that is in the same mind as Christ Jesus has immense significance for all of us as it affects how we see our patients, the policies we make, and what we see as the goal or the telos of our vocation. One of the many reasons I'm not a utilitarian is the fact that many human goods cannot be weighed against each other in some type of calculation. This is true in almost every area of life, but it has been on dramatic and tragic display during the pandemic. There is simply no way to weigh the good of honoring human life by a funeral, for example, against the good of lessening the spread of COVID-19. Obviously, the kind of human being and human flourishing revealed by God through Jesus Christ has nothing to do with the utilitarian calculation. We are called to imitate and find his face in the least ones on the margins of the culture, period, regardless of what the math, which is impossible to do in ethics, tells us anyway. We'll end with a story from the gospel accounts. In Mark, we are told that the disciples brought Jesus a blind man, and the writer says, so he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. What can we learn from this? So very much. Jesus heals the outcast, the leprous, the blind, to restore their dignity. He discards none who calls out to him. This is medical ethics at its core, to heal the sick, to protect the sheep as under shepherds of our great God and Savior. Jesus didn't advocate that the person be euthanized. He did not get to know him. It reminds me of something a patient once said, many doctors save lives, but you made me feel that my life was worth saving. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristen, for your remarks. And to all three panelists, thank you very much for sketching such a clear picture of what the basics of bioethics look like. Um, let's turn to our first question of the evening. Um, and this has to do with patient autonomy. In the current area of patient uh, current era, sorry, of patient autonomy, how can physicians practice the good that Kristen was talking about while also accounting for the wishes of the patient? Um, in other words, how can we like balance the potential conflicts between patient and physician um, needs and goods? And how can how can we reconcile any issues in that regard? I guess I can start by um, taking a shot at this question. So um, there has been a movement in medicine, obviously, um, which I think it comes from a good place around 
trying to, um, you know, move away from a paternalistic aspect that's been dominated in medicine for a long time towards uh, patient-centered care. And so there's a lot of talk about patient-centered care and patient-centered care is good, but what I prefer to talk about actually is relationship-centered care. There's actually two people coming into, I would say, a covenant of sorts, right, in a relationship. And it's not just a patient demanding services from a faceless automaton, right? And so we have patient autonomy um, for sure, and, and they, they have um, you know, their, 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 their wills and their desires of what they think that they need and want in the healthcare system. We also have the agency of physicians as well. Um, and we want to be sure that in the move towards patient-centered care, that we don't um, forget about the importance of, of physician conscience. Um, I know Charlie alluded to in his remarks that, and I've heard this as well from my colleagues in Canada, I'm gonna go speak about this um, later this year, about the threat to physician conscience in different parts of the world. Because physician conscience is very important, especially if we think about um, you know, people both coming to this, into this relationship and with both with moral agency. And, and physician conscience should be considered to be a tool and something that um, should be valued, especially if we wanna think about the diversity of folks that we want in the medical profession. Oftentimes folks come into medicine with religious commitments and they make it seem like the profession does that we have to check those commitments at the door and that's absolutely not the case. So we should be trying to have conversations in the vocation of protecting physician conscience is a good thing. And also at the same time, coming into conversation with your patients around um, values that they hold dear and be able to have a negotiation of sorts in relationship. I'm a primary care doctor, so I, I, I very much value the relationship, to try to come to an understanding of what's in the best interest of the patient in that relationship. I would just add something briefly. Uh, I mean, the, the story of American public bioethics, the story of American bioethics generally is a story of a reaction as uh, Kristen alluded to uh, uh, really a perception on the part of patients that doctors, as they became more technically proficient and capable of applying techniques and innovations of biomedical science and different clinical practices, they became more humanly distant. And so the patients, I think, asserted their autonomy and the, the, the entire legal doctrine of inf informed consent emerged from that sort of crucible. But uh, and and it, it, there is something important to defend, obviously, in terms of patient, patient autonomy and the collaborative involvement of doctors and patients, as of Kristen said. And, but let me just say briefly, <laughs> we need to figure out a way to make more doctors like Kristen. Um, that's the, this is one and more theologians like Charlie, because that that ultimately is going to be is guaranteed the sustainability of humane bioethical reflection. I just want to say that because I was so moved by what they both said. And I am a very emotional person. And it took a lot not to like say stuff while they were talking, uh, affirming what they were saying. But in any event, the, the, the second thing I'd like to say, though, is in, in order to balance properly, if that's the right word, or reconcile the competing goods, if they're competing or complementary goods of patient autonomy and self-determination and and the, the role of physicians is, is to insist on the preservation of medicine as an actual profession, to think of medicine as, uh, as a, pra a set of practices organized around uh, a particular set of animating goods, the, the principal good of which is the preservation of health, which requires us to think carefully about health and empowers doctors to make decisions about what is rightly in the interest of an individual of a patient's health. And, doc, and it's in fact, not just a violation of physician conscience, but it's actually, you're forcing a doctor to act against the very good of the profession itself to do something that that doctor believes is contrary to the health of the patient. And, uh, and that may mean we have to be thoughtful about how to disengage doctors from certain kinds of patients and help them find other sorts of care or to help the patient understand what, what in fact is is the doctor's vision of health that, that leads them not to provide them the thing that they're asking for, removing healthy limbs, for example, to take the uh, example that uh, was used a moment ago. I think, I think fundamental to the preservation of the proper balance or, 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 or way to reconcile these goods is to really believe and act on the belief that medicine is a real profession. It's not just a, a, service, a service provider. <clears throat> I'd also add very quickly, I agree with every single thing um, that Carter and Kristen mentioned. But I think the case of Michael Hickson um, really demonstrates why this is an important question from the person who asked it, because um, there's another side to this in the relationship, right? Which is, especially if we're gonna call out the ableism that's present in so much of the secularized healthcare, especially if we're gonna call out decision-making that is often stealthily done, you know, slow coding or show coding, um, 
uh, patients that uh, physicians or medical teams have just decided it's time for them to die and that their family doesn't know what they're talking about or something. So yes, everything that's been said, but also, I mean, just emphasizing the fact that there's a relationship here that can often um, complexify our kind of reaction to that kind of question, it seems. Thank you all so much for your thoughtful response to that question. As a follow-up to that, um, one of our participants has asked, how can we be pragmatic about bringing back these principles into medicine? So um, this person has a lot of medical practitioners in their family and is aware uh, that the medical field can be hostile um, based on sort of the current standards where it is. So how do we, how do we consciously bring these uh, questions and these principles back into the practice of medicine? I'll, uh, I'll just briefly s start off by saying uh, we need to acknowledge that there is no view from nowhere here. There is no perspective that doesn't have normative ethical uh, weight um, consideration. Uh, so if, if what's behind the question maybe is like, how do we get religious or theological concepts uh, back into medicine? I mean, this is a central focus of my book. I, we have to acknowledge that normative claims are already being present and all three of us have are all, all, already present in very dramatic ways. All three of us have, um, have talked about that. So we, we, I think we need to have, go in with a little bit of confidence actually saying, you know, um, listen, in uh, A, B and C examples, many of which we've already mentioned tonight, um, these values are, are already in play. And they're not named necessarily, as Dr. Collier mentioned, but they're in play. And here's how they're in play. And so if, if these are already in play, here's another way we're going to think about them. Here's another way we're going to bring them up. Here's another way we're going to engage them. Wonderful. Thank you for that answer, Charlie. Um, if we can now build off of uh, a component highlighted in Charlie's talk. And if we could briefly talk about Terry Schiavo and extend this to a discussion of how we view dying after uh, Terry's death, um, particularly in, in the question posed to us, um, we were asked about brain death in particular, but if we could even stay, step back and look at the concept of what is considered death more broadly, um, that would be a very interesting talking point moving forward. Well, I'll say a little bit about Terry Schiavo. Um, there's a lot that's not well understood about that case. Um, and there's a lot of, of misinformation about the narrative. It was sort of it was in fact not a case in which uh, it was simply a matter of, of a husband disagreeing with parents and then the court said the, the husband has the authority to make the decision. In fact, what happened was the Florida courts, which are a, a branch of the government, took control of the situation themselves and made a decision. In fact, it, it, contrary to the procedures that were set forth in Florida guardianship law uh, and made a decision based on her quality of life. Um, they, the, the opinions of the intermediate appellate courts and the trial courts couldn't be clear. They, they framed the question as to whether or not um, she should be allowed to die after, uh, you know, given, given uh, the, the, the bleak likelihood of her recovering cognitive skills and being able to, to be uh, conscious in the way that she had been before, clearly setting a kind of bar for for a, a life worthy of living uh, and, and a life not worthy of living based on a cognitive standard of made by people who are able and, and powerful and, and capable of that level of cognition. And, um, and I, I wrote an article about this in Constitutional Commentary in 2006, which explains that if a person actually cares about autonomy, they should be scandalized by the, by the, by the Shivo case because there was not, in fact, any serious effort to discern what her wishes would have been where the standard of proof requires the party seeking to discontinue life-sustaining measures to prove by uh, essentially beyond a reasonable doubt, by clear and convincing evidence that that's what the person would have wanted. There was no such evidence at all, but the court viewed all of the evidence through the lens uh, of the bias towards ending her life. Uh, because, and you saw the same thing in the Charlie Gard case, you saw the same thing in the Alfie Evans case, in which the courts in England said, 
essentially, if you, the diminished person in your, in your reduced state, cannot restore, be restored to a, a state of functioning that we idealize and believe worth living, then in fact, parents aren't permitted to seek care for that child, and that child has to die. Um, it wasn't quite as dramatic in the Shivo case, but it was functionally the same result, and it was structurally the same kinds of arguments. And it seems to me um, deeply problematic, to say the least, to, to, to have a functional capacities-based test to discern who lives and who dies, who's entitled to medical care and who's not. And I, the most vulnerable community are the people that can't speak for themselves, patients who can no longer express themselves. Uh, and and, and what, what we need and what Paul Ramsey has called for and the and wonderful people on this call have called for is you treat the patient that you have in front of you, not the idealized version of that patient. You give to that patient what that patient needs in light of his or her state. Uh, it is not the case that a, a patient has to earn the right to be cared for or earn the right to, to receive life-sustaining measures by meeting some kind of cognitive standard that is set by other people. Also, I just want to um, comment on, on this concept of social death as well. I'm not sure if the questioner is maybe getting at that as well, but you know, we think about different types of death and, and brain death and cardiopulmonary death, but social death as well. And actually it's Professor Kamosi that sent me this paper, but there's a really cool paper a few years ago that looked at um, patients um, that were resuscitated by physicians in, in a resuscitation bay in the emergency department. And these researchers were embedded in the res resuscitation bays to sort of see you know, who did physicians you know, resuscitate aggressively and, and who did they not. Um, and certain patients that were brought in were like not resuscitated in a way that you would expect actually in sort of according to the standard of care. Um, and those patients were um, patients that um, the physicians, um, they could tell from their acts had, had sort of deemed as socially dead. So these were patients that were not resuscitated were people that looked like they were undomiciled or homeless from the way that they maybe looked. Maybe they looked like the doctor thought that they were like addicts. They were people that looked um, uh, elderly and they were not, these patients were not resuscitated in the same way as like if the, you now the CEO of the hospital's husband came in, right? And so this, this paper basically went on to say that we know physicians in particular, um, because of their biases, like we all have, view some patients actually as, as socially dead or not mattering. And social death is a predictor of cardiopulmonary death. That's actually a self-fulfilling prophecy because these patients were not resuscitated. So it's interesting thinking about who we view as, as in the, the, Charlie talks about in his book, The Circle of the We, and who's outside our moral sphere of concern. Because again, people are like, well, what does it matter? Actually, it really matters because this affects the way that physicians resuscitate people and make policies that uh, decide who gets resources during the pandemic. But this, this concept of social death, I think, is really fascinating as well. And Charlie's, and not to speak for Charlie, but Charlie's constant reminder to us of Pope Francis's very compelling and beautiful phrase, the, avoiding the throwaway culture. I mean, nothing, you couldn't imagine a more stark example of the throwaway culture than not resuscitating people because you judge them to be no longer socially valuable. Yeah, I'll, I, so much good has been said. I'll just very briefly say, if if folks in the car aren't, folks on the call are not yet aware of the latest about so-called vegetative state and the science surrounding it. I think that's important to highlight here. Um, there's a 2015 book by Joe Finns, by no means a right-wing pro-life Christian or anything like that, quite the opposite, called Rights Come to Mind, where he details the fact that we can now actually engage uh, therapies with so-called vegetative patients that can uh, help bring them back to consciousness, or I think it's probably more precise to say, help us be more aware of their consciousness that was already there. And even a few years before that, there was a study done on so-called vegetative patients by uh, doing an fMRI on their brains and asking them yes or no questions about um, various things that only they would know the answer to. And they were asked if the, if the answer was yes, to imagine they were playing tennis, if the answer was no, to imagine they're reading in their room. And about a third, I think, of them got the answers correct. Um, and so that was even before uh, 2015. So there's more to say about that, but the science is widely... Um, unknown in the broader public discussions of these things, and I think it's important too. Thank you all so much for engaging that question. Uh, a follow-up to that question is um, how we might talk about these questions with students. So what would your recommendations be for speaking to young people, maybe middle or high school age, about living in a state where we might not be fully conscious of that person's consciousness, or they might not be fully conscious, or maybe suffering uh, physically, that life is still um, beautiful and a gift. How do we begin to open that up and unpack it with young people 
seeing as they are formed in a culture that does not share that conviction. I think it's so interesting that, um, I think about this with my students all the time, by the way, that, that, our, that our young people are formed like, like you just mentioned, but they're also formed in a way that really makes them sensitive to social structures that uh, send messages about what kind of lives are worth living and what are not. And they're hyper aware of their own participation in those structures, how they themselves have been formed by those structures. And so that rubs up against the kind of consumerist, uh, ableist culture you mentioned in very interesting ways, almost incoherent ways. And so my, my strategy um, is to really highlight uh, what it means to, to have an ableist consumerist culture and what, what sort of people that forms and how they are formed uh, by that and why the, where their assumptions come from uh, as a result of that and try to, try to dig in into their social justice kind of um, instincts as a bulwark against that way of thinking to say, you know, uh, let's take a look at our assumptions about what a good life looks like in light of the structures that you just mentioned, um, and then do an, um, an anti-ableist analysis of, of the, the judgments that you're making. And let's actually hear also from the voices of the people um, that we're talking about. I mean, one of the things that uh, is so important to mention is that, uh, you know, uh, physicians and medical teams and the broader, those that uh, have power in our culture tend to rate the quality of life of these populations way lower than the patients themselves or the people themselves. And so again, if you can get the voices of the disabled, the voices of those with catastrophic brain injuries, the voices of those um, in, these, in these situations, it's, it, it doesn't work all the time, but it's at least a way into the conversation, I think. Yeah, it's hard too, because when you're at a, an elite institution like a University of Michigan or Fordham or Notre Dame or, or, or wherever, where there's this hammer towards ambition and culture and, career, and careerism and drive to you know, grades and quantitative assessment. And I want to work at this. I want to get into this great medical school or I want to go work at this private equity firm or this great law firm. There's a kind of gravitational pull on the part of our students towards seeing themselves and others solely according to those kinds of metrics, which obviously privilege cognitive capacities and things like that. And I, I mean, there's, it's hard to, it's hard to know how to do this in a, in a, in a, in a systematic way, but there's really, and this is building on what you said, Charlie, there's really no substitute for having our students encounter persons with disabilities, right? And, and be, being present with people who, who suffer from disabilities. And I'm thinking about things like L'Arche uh, or, or other kinds of community opportunities. And some universities are doing a good job of this. In fact, the Ukrainian Catholic University is an amazing residential program where persons with certain kinds of disabilities live in community on the campuses. And, and Bishop Gujak, the Ukrainian Catholic Bishop and, and Patriarch of North America, if, if I'm probably butchering his title, but it's something like that. Um, he talks about how you know, even at the Ukraine, not even at the Ukrainian Catholic University and other similar elite universities, you have everybody's asking, what's your internship? What's your grade point average? And the only question that these folks have, these, these, these friends uh, for, with disabilities have is, can you love? That's the, that's, that's the question. And it seems to me that our, our young people, their hearts, in my experience, are soft enough to be moved by hearing, as you say, Charlie, the voices of the disabled and meeting and having a genuine encounter with, with, with persons with disabilities. And, and insofar as that's not possible in, in a real human encounter, we have to find art and literature and film that captures the beauty uh, of, of life uh, so, so, so we can change hearts and minds uh, through, through, through that cultural mechanism. Given what we were saying in a couple of questions ago about awareness, Charlie, I was um, struck by the fMRI that you uh, mentioned of these patients and Charlie uh, Carter rather I was thinking about Alfie and Charlie Gard. Um, given what we are learning about the ability for people to people can be aware in a way we did not really understand before, how does this potentially growing population of individuals impact a triage system or um, how do they influence limits on medical resources? Well, yeah, my, my dissertation was, was trying to use Catholic social teaching to think about justice questions like the one asked. And um, I think the first and most important thing, especially given what we've talked about so far, is to mention that, uh, well, let, the first thing is to say it is just the case we have to make hard questions about allocation of resources. So 
Um, we have virtually unlimited healthcare needs. We have limited healthcare goods. We're finite creatures. We have finite resources. It's just a matter of doing the math on those. The, um, the question though, um, it, in order to answer the question though, you have to start um, with, with defending human dignity. You can't say uh, that, well, you know, the quality of life uh, is somebody who's answering yes or no questions via an fMRI is so poor that we have to do essentially a version of a, a quality adjusted life year analysis and say, we can only put so many resources into your care. We're sorry, because we've judged your quality of life to be uh, uh, not adequate. So let's start there. Uh, those individuals are our equals in every sense. They share the same uh, nature that we do. Uh, and they bear the same image, image likeness of our creator the same way we do. And so uh, when we're asking questions about allocation of resources, we need to be absolutely clear about that and then ask tough questions. Uh, you know, do we have uh, a right to an unlimited uh, number of the community's resources? Um, the answer to that can't be yes, right? Because that would violate distributive justice in an important way. How that gets played out is the subject of a book length <laughs> study that I did in my dissertation and first book. I think it's really super complicated, uh, but it's important to live in that tensional space, I think, between saying we are not gonna make quality of life judgments. Um, and so maybe even the premise of the question is, I would challenge that, right? Like there is no special question to ask about um, patients in PBS that we wouldn't also ask about um, other human beings who are our equals as well. This is more of a question than a, an assertion, but I recall, and this is for for Charlie and Kristen. Maybe they they can augment this. What I'm about to say with some more interesting things. But um, Dan Solmazy at the beginning of the COVID crisis had some really interesting things to say that hadn't occurred to me before in the clinical context about patient abandonment as a robust concept to 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 try to shore up in thinking about the allocation of resources because it's one thing not to start care with someone because you think they don't meet a particular standard but an, an additional common problem when you're dealing with scarcity of resources is moving someone off uh, you know a life sustaining measure uh, to put someone on there so that the, that is deemed to be more worthy in some way and inappropriate along an inappropriate metric and it seems to me that um, strengthening the concept, the norm against patient abandonment and, and not, not withdrawing care from a patient who, who you've begun to treat um, uh, is a, seems to me to be a useful mechanism uh, towards, towards greater justice in this context. Our next question concerns the advances that we've seen in medicine in the past you know, century or so and the reality of death. So uh, this participant asked, with the advances of medicine being so significant, how do we maintain a proper perspective of the natural cycle of life and death uh, while still maintaining a respect for life that doesn't sort of overly indulge in a desire to preserve life at, at all costs, especially given our context as Christians recognizing death as part of, uh, not the end, but part of our uh, passage to eternal life. Um, I mean, I think one thing that we've seen in the in the pandemic, um, you know, I, I sort of alluded to this in, in the the story of my patient, Mrs. Wheaton, um, and the policies that were made were, um, you know, and, and the different disciplines have these have these ways of not being able to talk to each other, like the economists and the physicians and the ethicists. Sometimes we have these we have these silos, but um, you know, where there was the, the the thought of like preserving life at all costs, right? And 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 the goods that were sacrificed in the name of that, such as being able to give last rites at the time of death or to attend to, to patients um, when they were sick or to, to hold a funeral mass, like these things were these things were sacrificed on the altar of, of making health an idol. And as Christians, especially, we should be very wary of, of idol making and, and, and thinking about preserving life at all costs. I mean, that, 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 turns, that turns health into an idol. And we know from the scriptures that, 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 that you know, if we think about the, the martyrdom and, 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 and Jesus, we think of, you know, our lives are not to preserve at all costs and, and, and idol making is something that we should be very wary against. But some of the policies that we that we that we made um, at preserving life at all costs created the situation in which other goods were sacrificed. And I think as Christians, we're always trying to have the proper ordering of goods. And I think our 
our unique view, I think, of life and death hopefully helps us um, guard against that that error. I think a good so that it, in some ways the answer to this question depends on what you're worried about. Are are, are you more worried about people having their their lives uh, their deaths hastened on purpose, or are you more worried about people being ghoulishly preserved, you know, uh, in, for an extended period of time? And I, I tend to be more worried about the former rather than the latter, just based on my experience of, you know, just my, the human experience of, of attitudes and, and, um, and, and but, but, which is not to say that, that, that both aren't a problem. I, I find that the, the Catholic moral traditions emphasis on focusing on the intervention at issue itself is extremely helpful here and to avoid the, avoid the temptation to want to end a life or hasten the, hasten the death uh, of, a, of a person who you think's life is no longer worth living, while at the same time avoiding the natural temptation to want to keep somebody alive at all costs for as long as you possibly can, um, to focus on the question of whether or not the intervention is unduly burdensome, not whether the person's underlying condition is unduly burdensome such that we should hasten their death. And the ask, and this is this came up at the President's Council on Bioethics and in the report, Taking Care, Ethical Caregiving for a, a, an Aging Society, in that report, the council said, I think wisely, that we should, um, you know, choosing choosing against an intervention because it is unduly burdensome is not the same thing as seeking your own death, as, as seeking your own demise. And if, for example, a person wants to go home to be with their family uh, and, and to, to, to die in that context and chooses against an intervention that would take them away from their family in their final days, that's not a choice for death. That's a choice for a different kind of life. Uh, and, and it seems to me that's a useful point of reference to remind ourselves about that we're, we're talking, if you focus not on the underlying quality of life or condition, but rather, and what we hope and expect that person to be able to achieve, but rather the nature of the intervention itself and how it might interfere with the person's flourishing and their desire to, to live life to the fullest, even if it's a shorter life. I share uh, I share Carter's concern um, that if it, that if you're going to pick between the two sides of this that that I share his concern more than the other one. But but just to talk about the other one just for a minute, I just want to highlight um, again my kind of remarks about the battlefield medicine and the difference between aiming at death and and foreseeing but uh, intending not intending death. Um, that's a deeply deeply Catholic deeply deeply Christian uh, distinction and uh, plays all sorts of roles, obviously, in, in medicine. Today, I'd also just mention, this probably goes without saying, but but it's McGrath. We heard a lot of talk about Jesus and the, the saints, right? Um, uh, you, you don't have any better examples of, of, of uh, than Jesus and the, and the early church martyrs and even martyrs today, right? Uh, uh, foreseeing but not intending that death is a likely result of their actions. So, um, Again, I share Carter's concern that maybe the problems are more on the other side right now, but this is a real, real important part of the tradition too. Thank you all for that uh, very well elaborated answer. Um, if we could turn now to a question um, from a teacher participant. Um, this individual is a high school theology teacher who teaches a class in morality. And one of the topics that they cover is in vitro fertilization. Um, this question cites how difficult it is to teach this topic uh, without students taking the church's teaching on IVF as a personal attack on the way some of them or their peers were conceived. Do you have any uh, suggestions for how to begin this conversation or any resources that you would recommend um, teachers using in their classrooms or people in their parishes for that matter? I think the best thing written on this subject is a chapter. In fact, I've got the book right here. How funny. In the book, Body, Soul, and Bioethics by Gil Mylander, um, he has this unbelievable chapter on assisted reproductive technology. Um, chapter three, how bioethics lost the body producing children. I mean, it may, I think that's an amazing, and he's not Catholic, and it, not that that's a problem, but, but uh, 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 amazing, rich, beautiful, uh, as I mean, Gill is an unbelievable thinker and, and writer, um, reflection that, that, that is not, um, 
it's not going to make a person who's conceived by IVF or who has conceived a child by IVF. I don't think it's going to make them feel attacked or feel uh, accused of something, but rather it's just a very broad humanistic reflection on what it means to bring a child into the world and how a child comes into the world. Um, and um, I, I would, I might recommend that uh, at least the teacher read that chapter and then think about how to translate that into a high school setting. Just to add on, I, I think it's also just super important to start with the equal dignity of all human beings as yeah, yeah. Um, as the, the, the foundational starting point for that. And, and that the, the manner in which we come into this world um, does not affect at all um, the common nature that we share that bears the image and likeness of God. And I think also to emphasize you don't want to seem paternalistic, the vulnerability of people who are suffering from infertility and how there are, especially Christians, especially Catholics, who feel like their role or their vocation as married couples is to be fruitful and multiply and have children and all these big Catholic families with five, seven, ten kids. And you feel like your body has betrayed you in a way that you can't be the thing that you're supposed to be. And you're offered this possibility, and uh, and it's very tempting. And um, um, I think you know this isn't exactly responsive to the question about how to teach high schoolers, but really, it's really important to teach students in a moral theology class or a biology class about the beauty of adoption and what it means, um, and 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 how John Paul II, Saint John Paul II, talks about that as a form of procreation and grafting onto a family tree a child to, to, to be a genuine son or daughter and how especially adoption is central to our identity as Christians, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, who, the sort of concept of huyothesia, the, the placing of a, of a son or daughter in a, in a position of sonship or daughtership who doesn't, is not entitled to it by lineage. And you think about the fact that, you know, Jesus stood in the line of King David through Joseph, right? Like that's, there's a sense in which Joseph was a real father uh, to, to, to Jesus. And uh, it seems to me that um, understanding the beauty of adoption can at least take some of the pressure off people to feel like the only way to be a parent or to form a family is through, um, you know, uh, sexual procreation in the conventional sense. And Gil Mylander has a great book on adoption too. That was First book we published in our, in our book series, Notre Dame Press. Hopefully one of your future books will be a book co-written by all three of you. What a great conversation <laughs> that would be. So friends, we've come to the, the end of our time. Um, this has been a fantastic, rich conversation. We hope that you'll come back um, for our, our other webinars. This has set us up really well to go into some of those more um, in-depth on particular issues. I want to thank in a particular way Christina and Aaron, who have been working behind the scenes, uh, making everything run smoothly. Thank Heather for co-hosting with me. Thank our three panelists for a fantastic conversation this evening. And to thank most of all our participants who came and engaged and asked really thoughtful and important questions. So thank you all so much. We'll see you on March 22nd and have a great night. Bye-bye.